All right. So we're going to start by by just going through some um, a little bit of review with that oxymercuration. Um, two really good questions from the quiz. Um, does the equilibrium explain why acid catalyzed hydration and oxymercuration have such big differences in their efficiency and in their yields? Um, and, and that's really kind of tied to the second question is, is it possible, to, is mercurinium ion stable enough that you could actually isolate them? Um, and so those are kind of tied together in because the, if you have a really stable intermediate, that's also going to favor making more of that in equilibrium, right? It means that your equilibrium constant will favor making that intermediate more than making a more a less stable carbocation. Um, and so, and I, the second question I actually had not considered before. So I actually went and and uh, went to get a really quick Google. Google Scholar literature search to see if I could find any records. And I found a couple of papers that looked at there are some specific um, mercurinium examples that are stable enough that they can be isolated. They don't last long. They don't have a long shelf life, especially if they're exposed to oxygen, but they're stable enough that you can isolate them as a product, um, which makes them very stable in terms of intermediates. You can't see that with carbocations at all. Um, and so that definitely is playing a role in, in how efficient it is. You can make that intermediate with a much higher degree, higher yield, which means you're going to get your final product with a much higher yield. Um, and in the other part that makes it the oxymercuration higher final yield is the fact that there's no reverse reaction really that can happen especially if you have if your acetate is able to be removed from the system remember that first step for the um for the oxymercuration was you lost some acetate from your mercury acetate to make your mercurinium if there's a, if you have a way of removing the, the acetate from the system then you can drive equilibrium really far to the right and the second step at the very least has zero reverse reaction um you know, we always say that anything that can happen does happen. This effectively is so could be so backwards and uphill in energy. We can effectively say it's not an equil equilibrium reaction at all within sig phase, so to speak. Um, so both of those issues are gonna are playing a role in why it's so much more stable. Um, and when I did do a couple a couple quick looks at other papers, um, there are similar intermediates that you see with other metal ions. You can use other metal ions in similar processes. They're not always hydration, um, but you can find these three-sided ring structures in other with other metals. Um, but again, they're not as stable. And so they're not as, you can't totally write off mercury as nice as it would be to not have to deal with you know, toxic heavy metals in organic synthesis. Um, we can't totally get rid of them because they're still in the, you know, nowhere near the 90% yield range for most of them. Um, and even, um, even in more industrial applications, you, I'm sure everybody's heard of the catalytic converter on your car, right? Um, catalytic converter is basically a, it's basically a spider web looking structure. It's like a, a sponge almost. Um, made of really thin wires, made up of three toxic heavy metals, um, because those metals catalyze specific organic reactions that allow you to remove unburnt fuel and other byproducts, other sulfur and nitrogen-based byproducts from your car's exhaust. So it's basically a secondary reaction that's being catalyzed by these nasty heavy metals, which if I'm remembering right, Platinum is one everybody knows, but the other two, it's actually, they call it a trimetallic converter. Um, I believe the other two are palladium and rhodium, um, just because they all three of those metals catalyze different reactions that take something that's a gas that's really nasty and turn it into something that's a solid that's basically adhered to the surface of the catalytic converter, which is why catalytic converters eventually do wear out. And if you, um, 
I don't know if anybody does any work on engines, but if you have a lot of unburnt fuel um, in your in your coming in through your exhaust, like if you have a cylinder misfiring or just your your car set run rich, um, you're going to wear out your catalytic converter faster because you're making it work harder, making more catalyzed extra reactions because there's more unburnt fuel that's going through there. Um, a bit of a more of an applied side. Um, but there's, um, I'm trying to think of who wrote it. Um, there's a, a Nobel Prize winning chemist who basically tried to jump on the, I won't say jump on the, the train, I've tried to follow, emulate Richard Feynman and Carl Sagan in terms of becoming like a popular, popular science educator. Um, I think it was Hoffman, one of the Hoffmans. Um, and he had a really good you know, paper article written in one of his books that already talked about the trimetallic converter as being a really, really big success story for chemistry and chemical engineering. Um, it uh, was a pretty interesting read, especially once you've taken organic chemistry and you know some of the reactions they're talking about. We're going to talk about one of them, one of the big ones, um, later today or on Thursday. All right. Um, other than that, I looked at the quizzes, but I didn't grade them yet. Um, so can look, I'm going to throw the, the uh, questions up here real quick, and we can kind of go through them to review and see if there's any other specifics. Um, I don't think I duplicated any of the questions that we had from... Uh, from elsewhere in the in the uh, recordings or in the slides, there may be some overlap. But so acid catalyzed for this first one. Actually, we did do this one, didn't we? Um, or something very similar to it. Right. So we're going to make a carbocation intermediate on the secondary carbocation, which then can result in a methyl migration. So we're actually going to add our OH group right here. And um, if we did the same reaction with oxymercuration, we'd wind up with it added, our OH group um, added to the secondary carbon, no rearrangement. And same here, it's not shown as being acid catalyzed, but our reactant is a strong acid. So we don't necessarily rewrite it as being acid catalyzed. So our product in this case, we once again wind up with a methyl migration. Not an OH group, it's a BR. I think we did that example with, with acid catalyzed hydration, right? Instead of HBR, same net result, except we're adding a bromine instead of a, a uh, hydroxide. Here's our oxymercuration, demercuration. Um, I tend to only say oxymercuration because it's already enough of a mouthful. Um, we can't forget that we need that second step to get rid of the mercury. Um, so in this case, we wind up with it being added where? What are we adding and where? We're adding a hydrogen, a hydroxide, of an alcohol, and a hydrogen. And so where are we adding the alcohol? The more substituted carbon, which means we get this product, right? Um, and I know we talked about switching out the, here's an example of switching out the um, uh, nucleophile with water for other alcohols or nitrogen-based nucleophiles. Uh, in theory, you could use HBr or HCl. We don't see that very much though, so I'm not sure if there's experimental reasons why we don't see 
know, HVR added here to do a to do a bromination without um, without rearrangement, um, or if I'm just not remembering it and it is in one of these chapters coming, one of these reactions coming up, and we just haven't talked about it much. But in theory, any nucleophile can be put here. Um, and maybe maybe they're just not strong enough nucleophiles to be able to displace the mercury. Um, I'll look into that more. It just occurred to me as we were talking about so how all these reactions are the same with different nucleophiles. I'm not sure just how far that extends the oxymercuration part. Um, in this case, we don't get an alcohol if we have an oxygen based. Um, if we have an, an alcohol as our nucleophile, we get an ether, right? So still no rearrangement. We're going to wind up though with this molecule as our as our final product there. Any of these give specific issues? Anything you wanted to go over? Not so typically it's going to just because we have we're gonna have our char charges balanced, we're gonna have a neutral molecule here, which means we have to have something we can break off of this and replace with a new bond with a carbon. So it's it doesn't have to be all right. If you added something, if you added this in when it was in its derotinated state, they could still act as the nucleophile, it would still work. Um, because really, it's, it's the, in this place, we're not adding it, the hydrogen to the other side until the demercuration part, when we, have, when we reduce it and remove that mercury all the way. Um, and typically, it's because the stable version of the nucleophiles are not as harsh, not as strong. Adding ethoxide is a lot harder and more expensive than adding ethanol. So if ethanol does a good enough job, why would you necessarily add ethoxide? Um, it might also have some side reactions happening with the, the acetate or, or with the mercury if you make it too strong of a nucleophile. Um, so again, that's, that's another case of, let me look at the specifics and think about that. Um, but I bet you could use a deprotonated nucleophile, a strong nucleophile. There's just not not need um, for this particular reaction. Does change in stereochemistry consideration? Yes. So in this case, let's look at this one in particular. Um, because. So because the intermediate has to make that three-sided ring, and just like with SN2 reactions, we have to have our second step. This is effectively an, an SN2 reaction, right? When you have your nucleophile come in and break the mercury bond, one of the mercury bonds. So in this case, our intermediate is going to look like look like this, right? Well, I have the other acetate on there, but really it's the mercury we care about. So if we have to make this intermediate, we're very limited with our oxymercuration, we're limited as to where our nucleophile can then come in, right? Because just like we saw before with SN2 and with E2, we have to come in from the opposite side of the leaving group. So that means if our if we're going to break that bond, our nitrogen based group and ETH H, and then we have lone pair has to come from underneath. So the 
So it will slow down and in case in, we can expect steric effects. If these weren't identical methyl groups, if this was like a T butyl group, a bigger bulky group, they're both of these are equally substituted, right? So it's not Markovnikov's rule that we're really running into. It's just the fact that if we have to pick one of these to come attack, it's going to preferentially attack the one that's less, that's got smaller steric increments. Right. And that can even affect, and especially in a ring structure like this, if there was more stuff on this side. Um, especially pointing down into the port, you could wind up with, with that. It's not going to give you exactly a 50 50 mixture. It's going to favor the one that has less steric increase. So, really good question, Alexia and Rob, for that matter. Um, when it comes to this process, we're only going to, and I, we didn't talk about this last week, so nobody was going to get graded down on this on the quiz, but we're going to preferentially wind up with, so then we set our mercury facing up still, methyl down, and then this side, the methyl goes through that a ring flip or a stereochemistry flip, because um, it's an SN1 process, and our nitrogen is attached downward. So, and then when we come in and we need to look at the mechanism for the demercuration step, to know whether or not we get a second ring flip on this side. This is the react the mechanism we're going to add today, the um, hydroboration is much well, much more well understood. Um, and so we can go through it step by step, like we're doing here. Um, and but I believe we don't see a ring flip. So I believe we're, that in this case, we're going to the methyls being trans relative to each other. Um, but again, it's another case of, let me, let me double check that and get back to you. I'll check that at, at break because that's really relevant to what we're going to be talking about later. Question on the nuclear panel too. So when you have the um, mercury in the little ring there, the nuclear panel comes, it always goes to the more substituted. The nucleophile is going to attack the more substituted carbon. So the fact that that, that oxymercuration or that the mercuranium ion is really has a, has a, I just walked away over here. Slightly. We're here. When you've got that oxymercury or uh, mercuranium, ion, so let's say that this is two methyls versus only one methyl. Um, remember that this exists in a resonance structure where, where the one of these bonds is broken. And so if we have to choose which one of these bonds is going to be broken, it's going to be the one that goes to the more substituted carbon because that gives you a positive on a a tertiary carbocation as your as your other resonance structure, which is slightly more stable. Technically, there's the other resonance structure exists as well. That's going to look like um, positive charge on the secondary carbocation. But out of those three possible resonance structures, the one that's going to be most attractive to a nucleophile is the one that has a positive charge on the more substituted carbon, because that's going to be a stronger partial positive charge. Yeah, that's no, okay. It's a good, good reminder how this all works. All right, so um, there was just some more practice. I think we went, these are the ones we did go through. And we also looked at these ones. Um, so I'm going to skip through to our new mechanism. All right, and this one's going to be a little bit painful because this is going to be the most complicated mechanism we've looked at so far. Um, it's not that much worse than the oxymercuration demercuration, except we kind of hand wave the demercuration step because it's not fully understood. We know both of these steps 
and understand how they work pretty well. Um, so we're going to go through all of this react this mechanism. And it's, it's one of those ones where it's going to take a full page um, sometimes to draw all of the steps and intermediates. So this is a tricky one. Um, it still follows all of our regular rules, but it's it's still tricky to remember all the individual steps sometimes. So it helps to have sort of landmarks that you remember really well along the way. So like think about, I don't know, when you're first learning how to drive around town here, um, you might not remember exactly what the right turn is that you need to take in Sierra Track to get to your friend's house, but you need, but if you remember, oh, I need to get to um, that house on Knox that has the good Halloween trees, and then I go one one street past that and turn left. Knowing where that mark marker is in the middle is really pivotal to remembering how to get to your final product, right? So we're going to have some of those sort of landmarks um, in this mechanism where we can kind of point to, okay, I need to get here. How do I get here? And then that's going to help you along the way. Um, and this one in particular is very stereo specific. You only get the sin addition in this case. And when we're talking about the sin addition, that means that the two things that we're adding are going to both be on the same side of a ring structure. It's less important if we don't have a ring structure where we have free rotation. Um, but this is definitely a case that's very, very close to what we were just talking about, right? Um, we wind up with your, your new hydrogen and your new OH have to be on the same side of the molecule, same side of the ring. All right, and the other reason this is a really, really important reaction is because this is our number one go-to if we want to do a hydration that's anti-Markovnikov. So the Markovnikov rule was always put your new nucleophile on the more substituted carbon. So both our, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> both our oxymercuration and our acid catalyzed hydration, both were Markovnikov reactions. They both added your OH to the more substituted. Hydroboration oxidation is anti Markovnikov. And this is, it's na the naming works the same way as with the oxymercuration, demercuration. There's, this is hydroboration oxidation in two steps, just like that. First step is the hydroboration, second step is the oxidation. All right, and so again, the, we'll go through the whole mechanism. The net result, though, is add an OH to the less substituted, um, to the less substituted carbon. All right, and so the fact that it's stereospecific, that we don't get the anti-addition, tells us something about the mechanism. So, just like we talked about the isotopic studies and using stuff like that to figure out what the mechanism actually is. This is one of the, you know, all of these mechanisms, they had to be pieced together a little bit at a time by saying, okay, well, the fact we only get the sin addition tells us that allows us to rule out certain possible mechanisms. And once you've ruled out all of the, if you have four possible mechanisms you could write down and you can rule out three of them, What's left must be the right one. This is one of the things that's really frustrating about, about science in general, um, is that it's, it's almost a, a, it's a common misconception. Science doesn't confirm anything. The scientific method sort of by design just eliminates things that can't be true. Um, and so when you, um, when you design experiments in sciences, you're not designing them to confirm something, you're designing them to try and break a theory that exists or to break your hypothesis. And if they don't break your hypothesis, your hypothesis could be correct, but we'll never be able to say it's 100% correct. It just means we haven't been able to disprove it yet, um, which to people that don't live in the science world seems like we don't actually have any sort of confirmation because technically we don't confirm things, but it's still the best understanding we have, right? 
So its mechanisms are a lot like that, where they just sort of go through the, well, this is what's left, it must be right, or this is our best guess. So our first, we're gonna stop, start with hydroboration. And the other reason that this is tricky is that boron is weird. It's a bit of an exception to our, our rules of stability um, because boron in particular, how many valence electrons does boron have? Does anybody remember? So it's, it's next to carbon, one to the left of carbon. So it's only got three valence electrons. So boron can actually make three covalent bonds and make a relatively stable compound that doesn't have a full valence on the boron. It's a neutral atom that doesn't have a full valence. And that's part of what makes it so that this step can happen is it's got an empty spot. It behaves kind of like a carbocation, but it's more stable because it's not charged. It's got an empty vacant space that it can use. Uh, and here's the slide where I show, here's boron right next to carbon. Um, boring is BH3, it's neutral, relatively stable without a full valence on the boron. So what that means is that it doesn't have to break bonds right away to start making new bonds. So, you know, if you had that, if you had an SN2 reaction happen, we had to break a bond right away. In this case, we can actually start giving electron density to the boron um, before we start breaking bonds because it has an empty spot to deal with. And so that allows it to make these weird transition states um, and really kind of intermediates where we have like the, our alkene is sort of like stuck to the boron. Um, without making any any real um, bonds breaking yet, All right? And so, and just we did we talk about that symbol before the double dagger? Yeah. So that's just a reminder that um, that that symbol means specifically. That not that we're not talking about intermediate, we're talking about a transition state. Think back to the thermal from last quarter. What's the difference between the intermediate and a transition state? Not necessarily. Doesn't not not stability. Actually, let's let me make it better. So think about a potential energy surface. We have a reaction happening. Troughs are intermediates. Troughs are local minimums. Transition states are local maximums. So a transition state, you're right in that a transition state is not stable. But an intermediate can be unstable too. But intermediate is at least stable enough that it can exist for, for more than, um, for a finite amount of time. These transition states exist for almost an infinitely small amount of time. They only exist at these transition states as a pathway in between point A and point B. It's never gonna stop at a transition state. Getting something to stop at a transition state would be like trying to roll a bowling ball uphill and get it to stop at the top of the hill. It's for all intents and purposes impossible, right? All right, so the first step that we have in our hydroboration is literally just your, your pi electrons come up boron, we get this sort of four-sided transition state. This four-sided transition state is basically a simultaneous, it's like a hydrogen migration, a proton migration, at the same time that 
um, we're making a new bond between the carbon and the boron. Right, and the, the other trick with this is it's really not a proton migration, it's hydride migration. Hydrogens are actually more electronegative than boron. So this is the other thing that makes boron weird is if hydrogen is more electronegative than boron, then that means when you break a boron hydrogen bond, the hydrogen keeps the electrons. So everything else we've been dealing with, when you when a, you break a bond to a hydrogen, hydrogen loses the electrons, and you basically just have an H plus moving right. What makes this not just a proton transfer is that the hydrogen keeps the electrons with it. So, and the way it's that strong is you're breaking your boron hydrogen bond here, and it's moving over to the carbon, and the hydrogen comes with it. And so the net result is you take your boron, your borane, and the electrons that, um, and the hydrogens around the boron wind up getting moved to the more substituted carbon. And this is, winds up being a steric issue, right? If we have to, if we're going to move our hydride over and make a new bond between the carbon and the boring, but it takes the same logic as our oxy oxymercuration set, really. Um, we're going to make the bond between the carbon, the less substituted carbon and the boron, because that transition state looks like a positive charge on carbon. We're going to put the positive charge on the more substituted carbon. So, but that result, because we're moving hydrogen when we do that, not our nucleophile, it's not that our nucleophile is coming in to attack the more substituted carbon. We actually have hydride acting as a nucleophile, kind of. So we add the hydrogen to the more substituted carbon first. And then what we're going to do in our second step, in our oxidation step, is just like with the with the demercurations, we're going to remove the boron and replace it with something else. But now that's going to be where we add our um, our nucleophile, our larger nucleophile. Right. But first, what we do is we see that every single hydride that's attached to the boron is is a potential place that you can attach another alkene. So this is one of the few places where stereochem or where um, balancing the reaction does play a role. You only need about you only need a third um, as much boring as you have alkene in terms of moles because every boring molecule is going to be able to do this three times. So every boring winds up being attached to three carbons, and you get a trialkyl boring. Right. And the transition states wind up being what, what show us that it's going to be anti Markovic Right? If you try and look at the um, what would give us a Markovic addition, so our boron being above the more substituted for carbon, that's just more crowded sterical. And so what we get in, instead is we put the hydrogen above the more substituted carbon and the boron above the less substituted carbon. And again, it's not, in terms of kilojoules per mole, it's not that big of a difference because we do get, a, you know, 90% of this is going to be the anti markovnikov product. There's going to be a measurable amount of the Markovnikov product. Um, it just favors pretty strongly the anti markov and top products. Um, also, another note is when we're drawing these mechanisms, this is the appropriate way to draw this first step of the mechanism. So you draw your boring, you draw your alkene, and you show basically your two pairs of electrons switching over. I would draw it a little bit more explicitly Um, towards the the new new or the um, 
nucleus of those atoms rather than towards the new bonds that are being made. So I would prefer to see it drawn like that, but I'm not going to mark you down if you draw it like that to show the new bonds form like that. This is just more in keeping with what we usually do for our mechanisms. Show the electrons moving towards a nucleus. Um, and the other thing I was going to kind of want to say is anytime you have the same step happening multiple times in a row like this, it's okay to draw it once and then say it happens two more times and draw the final product up. All three. You don't need to draw all three intermediates. Um, that's a totally reasonable thing to do. Show the, show the work once and then just say, I did it two more times. That's okay. But you do want to make sure you show it completely. So show them the new intermediate drawing. Like that. And so it's weird that it's boron. It's weird that the hydride is really kind of acting as as a nucleophile, but not that tricky. It's only two two arrows, right? So you have to remember how this works, but it's not like it's that convoluted at this point. The oxidation step is the tricky one because the oxidation step starts with one it starts with a molecule we haven't really seen much before this peroxide molecule we're going to deal a lot with peroxides in this quarter um but in general the first thing that's going to happen to you so you add for the oxidation you add peroxide and hydroxide and that what the hydroxide is going to do is deprotonate your peroxide molecule so you get a peroxide a hydroperoxide ion um, that looks like this extra oxygen. It's a hydroxide with an extra oxygen. Basically. That makes it a pretty good nucleophile. It makes it that oxygen oxygen single bond is pretty easy to break, um, which is one of the reasons why peroxides are so dangerous, why you can use them to clean wounds and things like that. Um, it's because it kills just about everything. When you put peroxides into living system, they make lots of free radicals, which kill pretty much everything. And they react in a variety of different ways that are all pretty toxic. Um, just for everyday life, you never want to clean a wound with peroxide more than once. You do it once and you bandage it because you're also killing all of your cells around that wound as well. Every time you change your bandage, you use hydrogen peroxide on it, you're going to prevent it from healing. You actually wind up with more scarring taking longer to heal um, than, than just keeping it clean with soap and water um, once you've um, once you've sanitized it once. Um, so when we do this, and here's the part where the boron's empty orbital lines being a really big deal, is because we go from boron that's that's trigonal, that's sp2, that's trigonal planar. It has the empty spot so the peroxide ion can come in and make it a tetrahedral intermediate. And you wind up with that one of the peroxide oxygens attached directly to the boron, which then rearranges. So for each of these steps, the, what's happening with the boron is you're going from the boron attached to something that's not electronegative, the hydrides, to something to a carbon that's slightly more electronegative, to an oxygen that's even more electronegative. So we're kind of successively stepping down um, 
you know, who has control of the boron. The boron is sort of a, it's not electronegative, so the most electronegative elements are going to be really attracted to it because they're able to push it around better. Right, so we go carbon to hydrogen, or boron to hydrogen, boron to carbon, boron to oxygen, which then goes through a rearrangement to make this boron, oxygen, carbon. So the that tetrahedral shape R R R oxygen oxygen. When we do this, it's the electrons specifically that are between. We think of the molecule we're using here. And here's our new hydrogen that we had added on the last step. It's specifically the electrons that are attached directly between the carbon and the boron that move over. You're not going to move over these electrons or have any sort of rearrangement happen. It's specifically the electrons already attached to the boron. And then the, the other step is just leaving group leaves. Right, so it's a rearrangement, and this is a little bit different than the four, our four major um, mechanism steps, because usually when we talk about a rearrangement, it was talking about something like a carbocation rearranging to become more stable. This is still rearranging to become more stable. It's still a rearrangement, it just looks a little different. And so then the net result then is we lose a hydroxide, and now we have boron to an oxygen to our original carbon that was attached. So net result is you inserted an oxygen between boron and carbon. And once again, once we do that once, we still have two other boron carbon bonds. So we're going to do it two more times, just like we did on the, on the last slide. And so now it's not a trialkyl boron, it's a trialkoxy boron because we inserted the oxygen in between the boron and the carbon three times. So boron is the H3, we made a trialkyl boron, which was um, boron with three R groups. Now we have a trialkoxy boron. And then the last thing that's going to happen, and it, once again, it's going to happen three times, is now we still have a bunch of hydroxides around. And now the hydroxides are going to go through um, a nucleophilic attack to make another tetrahedral intermediate. But now instead of doing a rearrangement, we just wind up picking one of these off. Once we run out of the peroxy, the peroxide ions, it's not going to just do a rearrangement when you attach a regular hydroxide. You're just going to wind up with your alkoxy ion leaving. So your final result, the boring winds up, um, the boring eventually winds up as uh, boric acid. I, is it hyperboric acid? I don't know how you name that because it ends in a heme, not a not eight technically, but you wind up with boron with three hydroxides around it. Because you're just gonna go through and once we make our trialkoxyborine, we do a nucleophilic attack again, make a tetrahedral intermediate, kick off a alkoxy ion, which then we can just go through a proton transfer to make our alcohol. And so this is not one where we can really substitute different nucleophiles in very well. Because the nucleophile that we wind up adding in the less substituted position has to go through this step where you would attach it to the boron and then do that rearrangement. You can't really, there's not really a good place you could substitute another nucleophile in this case. So hyperboration oxidation really only makes alcohols. which is good that we have at least some place that it's simpler than the rest of our mechanisms because this is kind of a beast to try and remember the steps. The trick is 
for this one is to remember that successively getting more oxidized every step and that each step's gonna happen three times. And so hydroboration, you go from boring to the trialkyl boring. There's a landmark one. You can remember how this part, then you're at least there a third of the way there, right? And then you're gonna take the trialkyl boring go through a more convoluted process to get a trioxy boring. There's landmark number two. And then you're just gonna substitute in OHs. It's really, it's not quite a substitution. The net result is a substitution, but it's not SN1 or SN2, right? It's the, almost the opposite of SN1. Instead of leaving group leads and then there's a sec second step, it's nucleophile attacks and then leaving groups instead of the other way around. And that's the part that's only possible because it's boron. So then your final result for the boron, if we're tracking the boron all the way through, is that BOH3. Which maybe that is boric acid because I think. BO3 with a negative three charge and four eights. Protonated three times to get boric acid. All right. Questions at this point? Not till we start working through it, right? Let's do some example problems, then we'll come back and think about it some more. Or sorry, do some example problems, take a break and then come back. Uh, sorry, tetrahydrofuran, it's a solvent. So it's not going to play a role in the mechanism, really. But you can't, you can't do this in water because the water will react with boring before anything else does. And you'll skip all those, those landmarks in the middle and go straight to your final product of BO3H3. Um, so don't worry about it. It's just saying you need this to not, it could be in a, uh, anhydrous solvent. This first one, is there any stereochemistry to worry about? We don't have a ring structure or anything that's preventing it from freely rotating and we didn't make a stereo center. So for this first one, all you need to do, the net result is you add an OH to the less substituted carbon. And that's all there is to it. For the second one, there's a ring involved. Is that going to affect our products? If you're ever unsure, draw your product and then say, okay, well, if I added it to the other side of the ring, if I added it that way versus into the board, is that going to give me a different product? Any weirdness there? All 
are these two different molecules? No. And if you really want to be double, doubly sure, remember, so this is a sin addition. So you, you could draw the hydrogen attached to both of them to make sure. But because this carbon, this carbon has three other carbons attached to it, but both directions around the ring are identical, right? So we don't actually have two different molecules. If we had this, we had a methyl group on the ring, where now going one direction around the ring is different than the other direction. Now we have to be careful. We're only going to get these two stereoisomers. We're not going to get this as a stereoisomer. Because you need to add both of your, it's a sin addition, so both of the things that are being added have to be facing the same direction. They're either both coming out towards us or both going away from us. And for C, is there anything to worry about for stereochemistry? No, nope, so just put no H on the less substituted carbon. And I know I don't have to spend a lot of time on this since it's the second quarter, but make sure you don't, when you're adding your OH to your less substituted carbon, it's really tempting to say, okay, it's five carbons. So then I draw my OH there and lose the carbon in the process, right? That's less of an issue when you're adding it to the more substituted carbon because you draw all your carbons, then you add your OH, right? When you Put on the less substituted carbon, you have to remember draw that extra bond in there. So it's still five carbons and then your OH. Just an easy place to trip up. So that's a lot nicer than actually drawing the mechanism, right? It's just know what your product is. All right, let's take our break. Let's come back at five after. And we'll do some more practice with this. Do you want to do the whole mechanism? Yeah. Like after break. After break. <laughs> after break. Let's take our break first. And then we'll I'll set one up where we do where the stereo comes to come into play. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
a side note, unrelated to chemistry. If anybody's looking for a good, um, good Netflix series to binge on, I don't like to do that unless they're already all the way finished usually because I hate when Netflix cancels stuff after one season. Um, but uh, it's not my normal genre, but there's a historical historical action drama set in the, the Middle Ages in England um, about the unification of England from four separate kingdoms into one kingdom. Um, and it, does, it delves a lot into the interplay between the different groups that had immigrated to, I don't know if it's called immigration, if it's not actually one unified country, um, that had migrated, I guess, from you know, you've got the, the Saxons that pushed out the Welsh and the Britons that lived in Southern England first. And then the Saxons were the Christian country that we think of as being the earliest English countries, English kingdoms, um, that were then being pushed out by the Danish groups, which were more like Vikings. Um, so it's a lot about the politics and, inter and um, things like that that go into, that went into that time period, which... I, again, it's not something I normally get into. It's called The Last Kingdom. It's pretty good. Um, my wife and I have been binging that pretty hard um, the, last, the last few weeks. Um, the characters are well written. It's just historically accurate enough, but it's, you know, follows a fictional more or less person based on a real person. But all the major historical figures are accurate. All the kings and Danish leaders um, are all real people and follows the real events and battles. Um, so if you're looking for something, it's five seasons. They're all about eight to 10 episodes of an hour piece. So it's, we'll keep you busy for a while too. Um, if you're, if you're into that sort of thing. Anyway. Um, let's look at this example over here. In this practice, let's go through the mechanism here. So remember, first step is you add the borane. And again, the THF is not going to play a significant role. And it can be an advantage to write the borane's complete structure so that you can draw one of the bonds moving. And this is really going to help us see how that sin addition happens too. The boron is going to get added to the less substitution part of just for sterics. So just with the orientation we have here, you could draw one of these bottom hydrides moving over to the more substituted carbon. And then the pi bond moving towards the boron. So we wind up with our first intermediate that's going to look like this. And I'm going to draw the new bonds in red here. And we're showing the stereochemistry because they they both have to come from the same side of the molecule. You have to align this so that the boron is directly above the carbon, just as the hydride is directly above more substituted carbon. They have to be added with the same orientation. So when the hydrogen is up, the boron is up. This is the point where if you're showing your stereochemistry in your mechanism, rather than redraw the entire molecule as the enantiomer with it flip, you can write plus EA, which stands for enantiomer. And the enantiomer is gonna look like the same hexagon, but now your boron into the board, your hydride into the board, and your methyl coming out towards this. So I will draw it, but for the sake of 
saving yourself some headache and space. Our methyl group. Another day tumor is our methyl group is up, boron down, or do hydrogen down. Because those are two separate molecules, right? Two different molecules. The mirror image is non superimposable. So then the same thing would happen three times in a row. And we would wind up with boron with three of these groups attached to it. The other thing you can do here to save yourself some space is you can define R. You can say, okay, R is equal to, um, to what's going to be attached to the R, we can say R is equal to this. So then you can say that happens two more times, and we're going to wind up with BR3. And again, if we wanted to draw that out completely, it's boron. Said boron. We're going to just use the same enantiomer three times, really. It could be a mixture of both of these enantiomers attach to the boron. Base, we're not That's a mirror image here. What's most important about the way you would draw it is if we're keeping track, and, and really at this point in the mechanism, once you've shown that your intermediate is the sin addition, for this part, it's not that critical that you get the same, that you show the stereochemistry. Just remember that your net result is going to be sin addition in order to not have to draw that beast. Let me just double check on the, on the zoom here that I'm not. Okay. All right. So then if we have. Keep it left. Okay. No, I know why I did that now. I keep overthinking it. It's moving boards. It's too complicated. All right. So because the next step, the oxidation step, has that that um, proton transfer to kick things off. That's why it kind of makes more sense to have it set up like this. Because remember, step two was you need H2O2 and sodium hydroxide, or just a hydroxide. So our H2O2 looks like this. Hydroxide is the stronger base. So we kind of kick off our second part of this reaction by deprotonating the hydrogen peroxide. Make Hydrogen peroxide ion. And that is what's going to be able to come in here and attach to the boron and make that tetrahedral intermediate. So now all of a sudden we wind up with.
I'm going to redraw this with with only one of the cyclohexane groups shown. So we're going to wind up with We had the other two R groups attached as well that I'm just not showing at the moment. So this now we're in the third step of the second part of the mechanism. And remember, every one of these steps that involves the boron is going to be the boron goes to a higher oxidation state every time. Every time the boron is getting attached to something more electronegative. So in this case, we wind up with um, rearrangement happening. So you move over the carbon elect carbon boron electrons, the oxygen, and kick off a hydroxide. And this can this can't happen across the ring structure, right? This has to be right next to where the electrons already are. So this is what keeps it. We started by doing a syn addition, by adding our hydrogen and our carbon, um, our hydrogen and our boron bonds on the same direction. This is going to keep it on the same side of the ring structure because physically it has to be right next to each other. We don't have anything coming in and attacking the carbon from the opposite side. There's no stereochemistry flipping happening, right? So that keeps it so that our, our new intermediate is still going to be cis with respect to the hydrogen that I have stopped drawing here. Trans relative to the, the carbon was already there. But now we have an oxygen and then the boron. So I guess I, I misspoke. This step involving the boron that isn't oxidizing. Once you attach the oxygen here, it's not oxidizing the boron further. It's going to be oxidizing the carbon by moving, the, making an extra carbon oxygen bond without changing the boron. Really. Boron's oxidation state's not really changing at that point. But that's Beside the point. I will say, I think when I get the hang of these moving whiteboards, this is going to be really helpful because it allows me to kind of fit in infinitely long whiteboard by just shuffling them as we go. So I can keep moving from left to right. Right, exactly. If I'm, if I'm careful about how I do things, I have to play, play chess. I have to think a few steps ahead, but. All right, so then that's going to happen two more times. UP two more times, and we're going to get our trialkoxy for you. And once we get to this point, we can really just leave it as the R groups because nothing's really going to change significantly about the stereochemistry. Once we get here, 
all that's happening is cleaning up this, right? Because we're basically, the next step is going to be, we break this whole piece off all together and then just do a proton transfer to make sure we had an OH here at the end, right? So once we get here, the stereochemistry is not going to change at all. So we can just leave it as R groups. And so the last step for the boron was we make another tetrahedral intermediate with an OH added this time. But that gives the, the boron now has, when you make those tetrahedral intermediates with the boron, boron with four bonds has a negative charge. So it actually will, it's not unstable because this at least fills its valence, but it's, it's, unstable, it's slightly unstable because you've got that negative charge. So it makes it pretty easy to kick off a leaving group. So then, a leaving group leaves. Do that three more times, and we're going to get three deprotonated um, alcohol molecules. To get BOH three. Plus get three of our groups here, which look like this. Now, finally, the end is in sight. We just need proton source, which just call it a water molecule or any anything that can act as an acid. Um, but because we have all these acid base reactions happening, um, we have water molecules around as well. So we can just call it a water molecule and then give up a proton. And we get our final product. And the enantiomer. Right, so we will get been drawing it with the methyl down and the um, and the oxygen up, but we will also get. Might as well be consistent. The version with the oxygen down and the hydrogen down. Right. So the trick with the stereochemistry is this, you're never going to get them added in the anti configuration. But the things that you add are being added in this in the syn configuration, the cis form. And I, I keep reiterating that because you wind up with the methyl is trans relative to the hydroxide naming things, we could call that trans, but the addition was not trans. What do you 
you'll get both of those name teamers. Yeah, if you had something, if you started with a um, with something there where you could have some sterics, if we started instead of just methyl cyclohexene, if it was dimethyl cyclohexene, where you had one of these, another methyl group sticking up on one side, that could complicate things. But in general, I'm not gonna ask you to predict that at this point, just know you're gonna get both of these in roughly equal amounts. Most important parts is, is that the addition is sin and that you're putting the oxygen on the less substituted carbon. And now you probably have an idea of why mechanisms get kind of a bad rap in OCHEM. They kind of have a reputation as being the most um, obnoxious, might be the wrong word, most intimidating part of OCHEM because it, just looking at the reaction, it's much simpler to just draw your products than have to go through all of this. However, understanding why it's always the sin addition, or if you can't remember if it's the sin addition or not, then you might have to go through a bunch of these steps, or at least like, okay, what does it look like the thing? Okay, that's right, this is sin addition because the first step is, is that that boring formation. Um, so that's why you're saying it is. Um, and and I will go ahead and I'll go on the record as saying that um, one of the Probably the single worst chemistry test score I ever got was in OCHEM because we are starting we're covering mechanisms and like, oh, these these make a lot of sense. I can do this. I'm just gonna remember mechanisms. I'm not gonna memorize anything. I'm just gonna remember the rules for my mechanisms. I'm just gonna work it out on, on the test while it, as I go. And I totally went the wrong direction on a bunch of them and thought I understood it way better than I did. Um, so you do have to watch out for that to some extent. Um, especially if you're lazy and overconfident like I was at 19. Um, but they do make sense. So you just have to kind of drill yourself on it so that there's the there's a saying in, in music and in sports where you don't practice till you get it right, you practice till you can't get it wrong. And mechanisms are just like that. You want because all it takes is one wrong turn somewhere in the middle there and you get totally lost and have no idea what's going on anymore, right? Um, you want it to be the, to the point where it's fundamental and you could do it in your sleep. Here's kind of a, almost a synthesis question. You start with compound A, this is also part of how you do things like um, uh, qualitative analysis, figure out what you've made, is okay, well, I don't know what compound A is, but I know when I take compound A and I put it through a hydroboration, I get this. What was compound A? What did I start with to give me this? So it is kind of, it's similar to synthesis in the way that we solve it, work backwards. Right, so it was a alkene, because that's what goes through these reactions. And this carbon, I'd be part of the pi bond, right? Now, in this case, there's only one other carbon that it could be, right? What the other end of the pi bond has to be towards another carbon. There's only one other carbon attached to it, right? So with that in mind, what's the name of the molecule that we had of uh, uh, compound A? Two. 
two two methyl one butene. Don't forget we have to specify where the out the double bond is as well. And this is these are the ones that are kind of easy to check your work on then, right? Right. Take the molecule you think it is, go through the same process of okay, now working it forward, add an OH, break the pi bond, add a hydrogen to the more substituted and OH to the less substituted. Does that get me my other product, two methyl butan one all or one butanol? Yeah, it would work. And this here's another example from, from the textbook of that new newer naming system where you put the one the number in the middle of the name instead of saying one butanol, it's butane one all. Um, it's not that widely spread yet. In fact, if you go and look in our stock room, there's gonna you know, be almost nothing that puts the one in the middle of the, the parent molecule like that. Um, but it's starting to become more common. So um, be aware of both of those. All right, so let's mix and match them now. Let's do some practice with all three of our hydration mechanisms. And draw our products. New classrooms because we've been like, I have no idea if this is what these are made for, but <laughs> it works. So now I shouldn't lose my, shouldn't lose my markers as well. All right. So for A, what do we get?
First one is anti Markovnikov carbon hydration. So we put the hydrogen or the oxygen goes on our less substituted. So for B, no rearrangement, but Markovnikov. OH goes on the more substituted. As you said, probably some of these out that we had done in uh, the, this, some of the ones I pulled up your quiz. Um, so, we, so for E, our cognitive, and we do have rearrangement if necessary. It's not in this case because we wind up with. Our intermediate looks like this. So it's already tertiary. So our product then looks like that. And actually, for B, we didn't do anything with it. Do we have uh, any stereochemistry to worry about? Do we make a stereo center? Yeah, because this carbon where we added the oxygen is has four different things attached, right? It's got a hydrogen, an alcohol, a methyl group, and a T-butyl group all attached here. So we wind up with R plus S, where you can draw both of them. Same here, right? Both we have one our um, carbon that has our OH has an ethyl group, and two directions are both attached to our cyclohexane ring, but the two directions around the ring are different. So we wind up we need to say R plus S here as well. We don't need to worry about the other side. There's no stereochemistry here because this is free to rotate and it's not a stereo center. And here there's no stereochemistry. There's no stereochemistry here because this one has two hydrogens. This one where we added the hydrogen has our methyl group with, and then both directions around the ring, but both directions around the ring are identical. So this one doesn't have an enantiomer. Spot. All right, so for F, we're adding a bromine and a hydrogen. It's not hydration. Acid catalyzed, which means we do need to think about rearrangement if there is any. But our rearrangement, or sorry, our intermediate, is going to look like this. So it's already tertiary, so no rearrangement necessary. Do we get an R plus an S, or is it the same molecule? So it's sp2, so it could come from either side. When we add our bromine, did we make a new stereo center by doing it? Each side around the ring is identical. And then H.
anti-Markovnikov. So we're adding it to the the less substituted side. Do we need to worry about stereochemistry? Yeah. It's not shown, but there was already a hydrogen attached there, right? So we have four different things attached there. Did we make two stereocenters? The other thing we need to worry about with these is sometimes adding a hydrogen can make it its own stereocenter. But the ring is identical in this case, both directions around. So we're good there. So when we do these addition reactions, usually hydrogen doesn't wind up being an issue when it comes to stereochemistry. Because usually we're adding a hydrogen to a carbon that already has another hydrogen in most cases. But especially with these anti Markovnikov reactions, where you're adding the hydrogen to the more substituted side, if you're adding hydrogen to a carbon that doesn't have another hydrogen, you need to double check this one as well. So let's do one more. Like that. So start with not worrying about stereochemistry and then see how, how many stereochemistries we added. For stereo stereocenters, stereochemistries. Add the hydrogen there, add an OH here. Zero, one, or two stereo centers now. Two. Makes sense. I just told you that you needed to watch out for that and then came up with another example on the bottom of the odds, right? So, if we have two stereo centers, there's four possible stereo isomers, but we're not going to make all four of them, right? Because it has to be the same addition. So, if we add both of them facing up, then there's, let's see, there's a I down there that already and let's see. So it doesn't matter that they're exactly lined up with each other when they get when they first form, they will be, but then there's that little bit of rearrangement or rotation. They can either both be facing up. The main thing is to remember that the other bond that's pointed the same direction as bond pointing out is in the same direction and pointing away. So let's make it look a little bit more uniform.
the same molecule I had drawn just before. I just twisted it a little bit so that the OH was it was sticking down and out is now sticking up and out, which was the methyl that was flat is now into the board, and the hydrogen that was into the board is now flat. Right, so I just took it and was like this, and I did that. So we could have that molecule, or we could have both of them adding from the opposite side. you're not going to get them adding in the opposite directions. Just because we have three minutes left, and it'd be good to have a little review. Let's, let's uh, write out the stereochemistry for this. Or, sorry, the R's versus S's. Right, so the left hand stereo center on the top molecule, if I rewrite it, we've got. Priority four coming out towards us. Priority one is down into the right because we go carbon and then an oxygen. So that's higher priority than the ethyl group going the other direction. Two is going to be there and the methyl group is into the board. So one to two to three is clockwise, but four is pointed out towards us. So if we step into the board and look out at it, we would get S. It looks like R, but it's reversed because the four is sticking out. Which means without even having to do it, the bottom one, that's gonna be S. Everything's flipped except now our priority four is being to the board already. For the right hand on the top molecule, we've got out towards us is going to be our highest priority. Down is priority four. Up and in the or up into the left is priority two. The end of the board is priority three. So that is one we probably want to spin it, rewrite it. We want to put priority four in where number three is. We can take these, look like this. My thumb is where we want to put my thumb or my middle fingers. So we're going to do that. So that's going to put four there, one here, three is coming out of the board now, and two didn't move. So now one, two, three. The artist So I see this one as R. And this one is S. Where the other person in the work group? So these one, this one. So one, two, three, it looks like R, but four is out towards us, and we want it in towards into the board. Did I assign the priority wrong? Like one, two, three. So this is top left, 
priority. One is down at the right, two is down at the left, three is up in either the board. So that looks like R. Oh, yeah, you're correct. So I forgot to uh, switch it. I walked through that and then when I wrote it down, I wrote it wrong. So you should make sure if it was in my head then. No, 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 you're absolutely right. So we can have SR or RS, but we can't have SS or RR. And in all likelihood, they probably would not be formed in perfect. I guess the both of them are planar when we start it. So you are going to get almost exactly 50. All right. So we only added one new mechanism today. Not that bad. It's, it's a nasty one. <laughs> but we're taking our time. Um, so today's lab, I believe it'll be a relief um, because I believe we're just going back to looking at substitution reactions. Um, we're gonna we're going to go through and do the experiment that shows how the primary is faster than secondary is faster than tertiary for first order and reverse in second order. Um, so we're just it's simpler mechanisms, but it's going to actually have you looking at the raw data that shows those things, which is kind of fun. So you don't just have to take your word for it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like I keep saying that they get, they have to get creative and figure out these, these mechanisms and some of these rules. Well, let's, let's go do that ourselves. So it's a, it should be a relatively fun lab. Um, yeah. So be there at at one, and we'll get started on that. Also, it's a STEM meta major sticker. If anybody hasn't found had one of those yet, has a need, help yourself. 